When the winds of change Like a hurricane Blow your life Into the ground When the dreams That keep you going Feel so far away and gone When every night Is an experience And simply holding on You're still on my mind When this world was so much younger Well maybe that was me Now our dreams are growing older But we're still living to be free There's a light that shines forever In our memories and our eyes Oh Lord, you're still on my mind How much winter snow has melted Underneath the bridge But the river Is a feeling That will bring us home Again When the golden heat of summer Is just a memory And the whiteness of the winter all that we can see Like the light that shines forever In our memories and our eyes Oh Lord You're still on my mind You're still on my mind Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Church here at uh, 125 South Pennsylvania Avenue in Lansing, Michigan. This is November 19th of 2023, and this is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, so we call it Thanksgiving Sunday. We want to thank you for coming to join us, but then uh, we're always grateful that you are here, whether you are in person or online. Thanksgiving Day is coming, and of course, every Sunday, and for that matter, actually, every day, is a time for us to express our gratitude to God for the blessings we have received. Gratitude is a spiritual discipline we all need to be aware of and practice. Also today, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we are children of the light, and then we will turn to the gospel where we will look at the parable of the talents. May we be all become aware of the many things we can be grateful for. And let me just mention that this past Tuesday, one of our members, Richard Reist, passed away at the age of 96. His funeral was on Friday at his daughter's church, so please keep his family in your prayers. These are some announcements on this November 19th, 2023. Last Sunday was our Faith Commitment or Stewardship Sunday. Thank you for your commitment to support the ministries of Pilgrim Church. Marjorie Martin will say a bit more about this in a while. We want to thank Pete Wittig for enhancing our music this morning. Thank you, Pete. You are all invited to a fellowship time in the parish hall following our worship service. Pilgrim gave out Thanksgiving baskets yesterday, and we are getting ready to put together our Christmas baskets for later in December. These baskets provide a holiday meal for needy families in the area through Christian services. 
Judy Hackett has organized the effort and she did the shopping for the items for the baskets. But we need monetary contributions for the Christmas baskets. As you know, the cost of food has gone up significantly. And if you can contribute, please write your checks to Pilgrim Church with baskets in the memo line and put the checks in the offering plate in the back of the sanctuary. Continuing our announcements, uh, there will be no Bible study tomorrow or on Tuesday at Bircham Hills and no Christianity 101 session this week. Pastor Peter will be taking some needed time off before Advent. He's planning, however, on helping with the Thanksgiving meal here at the church on Thursday. Speaking of which, Pilgrim Church is offering a Thanksgiving Day meal from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. this Thursday, and that would be November 23rd. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the hallway if you want to have the meal here. Please contact Betty Briggs or Judy Hackett if you can help with the setup, serving, or cleanup. Always necessary to have people help with efforts like that. On Saturday, December 2nd, we will be decorating the church for Advent and Christmas. Sometimes this decorating is called Hanging of the Greens. We will begin decorating at 10 o'clock on December 2nd, that Saturday morning. Everyone is invited to help. Then on Sunday, December 3rd, that's the beginning of the church season of Advent, the time that's leading up to Christmas. St. Luke's Lutheran Church across the street is collecting costs, coats to donate to those who are in need, and that will happen on December 9th. For more information, call the church office. If you have any gently used coats, winter coats, uh, that would be suitable for people, uh, contact the church office. Uh, we'll figure out a way to get them over. We had a, uh, a basket out front, but I think that might be gone right now because this will be the last day of their coat giveaway. Now, the executive ministry team for Pilgrim wants to thank those of you who have continued to give your support to the work of Pilgrim Church. Uh, we all know that we live in trying times, but your commitment to Pilgrim Church is very much appreciated. Now, the chair of our stewardship team, Marjorie Martin, has a quick stewardship message for us. <clears throat> Good morning. Last Sunday was our designated Stewardship Sunday or Faith Commitment Sunday. We want to thank those of you who made commitments to support Pilgrim Church for the coming year. We have 16 pledges amounting to $56,868. We will continue to receive pledge cards, so if you have not filled out one yet, please do so and either put it in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary or return it to Pilgrim Church's office, either by mail or in person. Faith commitment cards are available outside the sanctuary. Stating your commitment helps Pilgrim to determine a more realistic budget and planning spending for our congregation. We hope that you will continue to give your support to the church and its ministry and we understand that if your circumstances change in the coming year, that your pledge will be affected. If your financial situation worsens, naturally you will be giving less. And if things turn out better than you expected, then you can offer more than what you've pledged. So please fill out a card. Now let's greet each other with peace. Please be seated and let us pray. Most generous God, we thank you for the gift of life and all its wonders and experiences. We thank you for the bounty of the earth we live on. 
We thank you for the people who love us and whom we love. We thank you for your love of us. Your love and your spiritual guidance brings out the best in us. May we strive for what is best in us. All that we have is a gift from you and is meant to be shared. You have given us so much, God, and your blessings are beyond measure. We come to you with grateful hearts for the bounty we enjoy from your providence. May we take your example of generosity and do likewise in our lives. Bless us with your presence this day. Amen. Pete has another song for us. We are there, very thankful. All right, I was going to do something different, but uh, I'm going to do a song about the rivers that run through our cities at this time of year. A river runs through the city I live in and roll on its course since long before me. How sweet would it be for all of our babies to leave them that river better than it is. Searching for love and all the right places like the way that shines on your face all the way that that river runs to the ocean so let's leave it better so much better call to worship which is printed in your bulletin. The day of the Lord is dawning and you are children of the light. Yes, yes we, we are, are children, children of the day and we welcome the day of the Lord. Keep awake to the works of God and to the opportunities to do God's work. Our spirits will not fall asleep like others do, but we will live in God's light. God has given each one of us talents, abilities, and resources to be used for God's purposes. We will invest our resources in God's work as we encourage one another and build each other up. May those who are able please rise for the opening song. Come, You Thankful People Come was made from combining two Thanksgiving hymns by the 18th century poet Anna Barbald and the 19th century poet Henry Alford. Who did the combining in the 20th century? We do not know, but the result is a well-known song of Thanksgiving for God's providence. Come, You Thankful People, all three verses. <laughs> Yeah. 
First Thessalonians is a part of the apocalyptic literature in the Bible. The letter speaks of the day of the Lord, which comes at the end times of the earth as it currently exists, and the dawn of a new world. In the early part of the Hebrew scriptures, the day of the Lord was seen as a day when God will make all things wonderful and bright. But there were prophets who warned that before the good times, the day of the Lord would bring destruction. The Apostle Paul writes here with the same understanding. The day of the Lord will come suddenly without warning, and there will be devastation for those who work in spiritual darkness. Paul tells us, however, that we are children of the light, and we walk with the God of light. So Paul encourages us all to be aware of the works of God and to encourage each other to live as children of light. In gratitude for God's salvation, we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, 
and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Pete is sharing another song with us now. One of my favorite songs by a Nashville songwriter named Alan Reynolds. It's called Ready for the Times to Get Better. Na 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 You're all welcome to sing. Na 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 I've got to tell you I've been racking my brain Hoping to find a way out I've had enough of this continual rain Things will get better, no doubt It's been a too long time With no peace of mind And I'm ready for the times to get better Aren't we all? from me what I cannot give It gets so lonesome at times I have a dream that I wish I could live Burning holes in my mind It's been a too long time No peace of mind And I'm ready for the times to get better Everybody sing na 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 It's been a too long time with no peace of mind and I'm ready for the time to get better. Uh, Karen is going to go do some Sunday school work. Okay, she's, she's not running out on us, all right? Hey, I remember back in the days uh, when I was in seminary, we had a guest speaker in one of our daily chapel services. And the speaker was from South Africa, and this was during the time when the policy of apartheid was still very much in force. The speaker told of some of the horrific cruelty that African people suffered at the hands of the minority white population. And we felt for this person who had struggled under such unjust an unjust racist regime. And the person then pointed out the freedom that so many of us enjoy in this country and how there is an abundance of food and political liberty. And the person asked, how should we respond to our privileged conditions in our country? And people shouted out that they, well, we could get petitions and we could contact our senators and representatives to get South African government to dismantle apartheid. And the speaker said, well, yeah, that, that's good, but was looking for something else, obviously, and others shouted out that they could make sure that they voted and assist people to register to vote. And the speaker thought, well, that's a good idea, yeah, but wanted some other answer. And after a couple of suggestions more, the congregation became silent and seemed a bit puzzled by what the speaker wanted. And after a period of awkward silence, the speaker said, be grateful for what you have. You enjoy things that I can only dream about. Be thankful for what you have. We all need to be thankful for what we have. All too often we see the hole instead of the donut. 
We focus on the one negative thing and overlook the hundred positive things. So be grateful for what you have. The parable of the talents is the third in a series of judgment parables by Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. This parable is about how we use the gifts that God has given us. Three slaves are entrusted with various amounts of money, while the master, who is God, is away. One is entrusted with five talents, another with two talents, and the third slave is given one talent. A talent was an amount of money equivalent with 6,000 denarii. A denarii was one day's wage for a laborer. So for a laborer, it would take 20 years to earn one talent. It was a very large sum of money. Two of the slaves invest the master's money while the third buries his portion. God may not have entrusted us to an exorbitant amount of money, but we all have God-given talents. How are we using the talents that God has entrusted to us? Keep that in mind as we read the parable of the talents from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The scriptures consistently and frequently describe good and evil in terms of light and darkness. Light and darkness are metaphors for spiritual good and evil. Things that are good are either the source of the light, such as God and Jesus, or they are bathed in light. The scriptures call God the creator, the father of lights, and Jesus is described as the light of the world. Further, God is described as the creator of light, both physical and spiritual light, and Jesus is described as the source of creation. 
Jesus is the word of God, and through the word of God, God creates. For example, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God speaks, and it's done. On the other hand, darkness is what God overcomes by the light. We can figure that darkness was chosen to represent what is bad and evil because of our natural human fear of the darkness. Can't see in the dark, so we do not know what dangers may lurk in that darkness. We can imagine all kinds of harmful things are waiting there to pounce on us from the dark. In the 23rd Psalm, the most fearful place to be is in the valley of the shadow of death, and we speak with fear or revulsion about shadowy or shady characters. Darkness and shadows have bad things in them. The Apostle Paul uses the metaphor of light and darkness as good and evil in his letter to the Thessalonians. And as we mentioned earlier when introducing the scripture passage, Thessalonians is a part of apocalyptic literature. Paul is referring to the end times. He is referring to the time that scripture calls the day of the Lord. And as was mentioned in the early writings of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the day of the Lord was seen as the moment in time that God intervenes and transforms this fallen world into a beatific world. But there were prophets who warned people that the coming of God on the day of the Lord is a day that evil and unrighteous people should be terrified of because part of God's transformation of the world is to destroy the bad and evil in the world. So for those who walk in darkness, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment and reckoning, a day of comeuppance and punishment for all people's dark deeds. Now Paul is warning those people who do not believe that they will be punished for their injustices and unrighteousness. And the unrighteous believe that God will give them peace and security. Paul says that for these people there will be sudden destruction as the Lord comes like a thief in the night. Paul is mirroring the words of Jesus who said that no one will know when the time will come for the return of Jesus on the day of the Lord. There will be suffering on the day of the Lord, but the suffering will be like the labor pains of a woman giving birth to something new and beautiful. And Paul assures the followers of Christ that they will either be spared the suffering of the earth's transformation or that God will make sure that they get past the suffering to enjoy the new world. God's faithful will will not be surprised by the day of the Lord, not because they will know when it will happen, but because they will be ready for God's kingdom. They will see the new earth because they are children of the light and children of the day. Their attitudes and actions are consistent with the will and ways of God. And those who are of the night and of the darkness are those who do not know God and so will not follow God's ways. So the night and darkness refer to the ignorance of God's will and ways. We sometimes say that a person who is ignorant is in the dark or even that they have a dark mind. And if a person is ignorant of God's will and ways, then Well, they will not do as God wants them to do. But Paul says that the followers of Jesus are not spiritually in the dark. They are not people of the spiritual night or the darkness. Rather, they are people who live in the spiritual light of day. So Paul continues to advise the Thessalonians and encourages them not to fall asleep as others do, but for them to keep awake and be sober. And of course, keeping awake means to be conscious or aware, to be aware of the work of God in the world, to be aware of the goodness in the world. Paul also means keeping awake to mean people keep doing the things that please God, 
has nothing to do with real sleep. Paul then uses another metaphor in this passage. We have already had day and night, sleeping and waking, being sober and drunk. Now Paul talks about putting on armor. He's, he tells the faithful to put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Paul will speak of faith, hope, and love in other writings, most notably 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's chapter on love. Faith, hope, and love are important because we need to be awake to these things. We need to be aware of these things. We need to be doing these things. We need faith or trust in God in Jesus Christ. For in our trust of God and Jesus Christ, we find hope for a better world. And we need love. Love is the expression of our faith and hope. And part of our faith in God or our trust in God is that God loves us. And because of that love, God gave us a way to be connected to God and to be saved from the darkness of sin and death. Jesus and what Jesus did was the greatest expression of that love of God. And if we have faith in or trust in that love of God to redeem us from a separation from God, well then we have hope in a better world and personal circumstances to come. And when we accept that God really loves us, we can rightly love ourselves and we can love other people for their own sake and not because we are using them. So love makes all good things possible. And out, from, out of that love from God and about ourselves and for other people, Paul urges us to encourage one another and build each other up. So you see, the gift of God's love is like God gave us a whole bunch of talents to use. Oh, wait, wait. I'd better tell you another story before I go on with that idea. So let's turn now to the parable of the talents in Matthew's gospel. Okay, when we think of talents, we most often imagine people's natural, physical, and mental abilities and skills. We praise the musical talents of our musicians. You know, we admire the talents of many athletes. We're impressed with the talents of really smart and clever people. We look, upon, we look up to the talents of artists who make beautiful paintings and sculptures. Now originally, a talent was a unit of weight or measure corresponding to an amount of money. And as was mentioned in the introduction to the gospel lesson, one talent was the equivalent of 6,000 denarii. And a denarii was a day's wage of a laborer. So a talent was the equivalent of 20 years of a day laborer's wages. In the parable, a wealthy man who, who represents God, you know, gathers three slaves. And the slaves, well, they're you and I. And the wealthy man entrusts his property to them. And the man gives them different amounts of money quote, each according to his ability, as the scripture states. And the third slave in the parable received a large sum of money, a sum of a lifetime, one talent. But the wealthy man was very wealthy, and he gave two talents to another slave, the equivalent of 40 years of a day's laborer's wages. But then he gave the other slave five talents, the equivalent of 100 years of a day laborer's wage. And the parable says that God gives each one of us or entrusts to each one of us a certain amount of resources. Unfortunately, these resources do not usually come in the form of large sums of money, but rather God gives us natural abilities and from these natural abilities, we can develop skills that can be used. We call these things talents. And the use of the term talent to mean an ability or skill 
came about in the 13th century in Europe from the interpretation of this parable. God gives us life, and God gives us natural inclinations and abilities. Notice that they are all a gift from God and not necessarily something for us to brag about. Our natural abilities are a gift from God because they belong to God, and they are to be used in serving God. The first two slaves in the parable understand this very well. The first slave took the five talents and trusted to him, and the second took the two talents and trusted to him, and by some means of financial wizardry, they doubled the amount that was entrusted to them. Their master is very pleased with what they have done and says that they have done very well in a few things, so now their master will entrust them to more things and they will enjoy a close and happy relationship with their master. We need to focus on our relationship with God to properly understand this parable. And that becomes more clear when we see what happened to the third slave. Remember that the third slave received one talent, much less than the others, but still a great sum of money. But instead of investing it like the, two, the other two, he buried the treasure to make sure he would not lose it. And he returns the talent intact to his master. And for this action, the slave is called wicked and lazy and told that he should have invested it to make more. And the money is taken from him and he's thrown out, quote, into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Obviously a very unpleasant place to be. God has given us life and natural abilities. And these are the talents which the master has given to us. Some of us get more talents than others. But to understand this parable, we have to look beyond the money. It is really about the gifts that God has given us and how we put them to use. Some of us have a talent for playing music or singing. You know, some of us have a talent for working with our hands, building objects, mechanical repair, creating art, organizing, healing, etc. Others have talent in mental and emotional areas such as working with math, counseling people, designing objects, etc. But whatever abilities and skills we have developed from our abilities and opportunities, God expects us to use them to build God's kingdom. We are to invest in growing God's kingdom. We are to invest in and use our abilities and skills to promote love, kindness, compassion, empathy, sharing, generosity, and more. These are the expressions of the children of light. These are the things that God brings on the day of the Lord. And these are the things that bring spiritual light to overcome the darkness of fear and hatred and prejudice, arrogance, and greed, and more. We are entrusted to grow the light and to let our light shine so that others may see it and give glory to God. So we displease God when we do not use our talents to grow the light of love in the world. We are not meant to bury our talents and never use them. We are to invest and use them to do good in the world, to make this world more like the kingdom of God. And we are called upon to discover our talents and to develop our talents, and to use our talents to multiply the light of God. Hmm. What talents have you denied or buried somewhere? Dig them up and invest them in the light of God. And since we're on Thanksgiving Sunday, just a further word. What is the appropriate response to discovering and accepting our talents? To be thankful. And how do we express our gratitude? 
use our talents in service of God's purposes. All right, time for us to pray. Dear God, awaken us to live in gratitude. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for giving us a planet rich in natural resources. Thank you for your commandments and the words of the prophets. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who showed us how to live and who died so that we could live abundantly on earth and eternally in the world to come. Help us to appreciate the gifts that you have given us and do not take you for granted. May our devotion to you grow and our generosity to others increase. May we support the ministry of Pilgrim Church as we do God's work with our time, our talent, and our treasure. Let your spirit be upon us and among us to guide us to do all that is pleasing to you. For all the people who care for the sick and injured, we give you thanks, God, for their work. Watch over them and protect them from harm. We pray for healing of those who are in need of physical, emotional, and psychological healing. We especially ask for the people on our prayer list to receive loving care. We ask for your help in overcoming the divisions and strife in our families, communities, and nation. We thank you for those who help others find healing and wholeness. May we help the hungry find nourishment. May we help the lonely find companionship. May we help those who have been lost to you to be found and know the comfort and strength of your loving presence. Families and friends will be meeting for the holidays. Please keep people safe and healthy. May this Thanksgiving be a day not just of food and football, but of genuine thanksgiving for all we have received. We give you thanks, O God, for your love and grace. We thank you, God, for our blessings as we come together in spirit, as we pray our Lord's Prayer together. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> A German pastor and musician, Martin Rinkart, wrote, Nun danket alle Gott, now thank we all our God, in the 1600s, during the Thirty Years' War. There was devastation and famine, but worst of all, the Black Plague struck Rinkert City. 5,000 people died, including Rinkert's wife. Eventually, Rinkert was the only pastor left alive and was performing up to 50 funerals a day. But even through all this misery and hardship, Rinkert wrote one of the best known and best loved hymns of Thanksgiving, Now Thank We All Our God. May those who are able please rise and let us sing all three English verses. <clears throat>
the good in your life and offer your gratitude to God. It is good and right that we should rejoice in our Lord God for all the blessings we have received. Let us focus on the good in our lives with thanksgiving. And in the words of the Apostle Paul, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, and if there is any excellent, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God bless you all. Stay healthy and have a happy and grateful Thanksgiving. Amen. All we have is from God. In gratitude, we declare that our life is in God. My life is in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord.